for the joy that was set before him. It's a phrase that comes to us from Hebrews chapter 12, looking back on the sacrifice of Jesus. Hebrews 12 tells us, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. And then the writer goes on to add, consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. That powerful biography on the life of Christ, Desire of Ages, provides this observation. It would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. As we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, Our confidence in Him will be more constant. Our love will be quickened. And we shall be more deeply imbued with His Spirit. For the joy that was set before Him, He endured the cross, despising the shame. When did that begin? of centering his mind on the joy that was set before him. Did it begin for him when Jesus experienced his first recorded visit to Jerusalem for Passover? When at the age of 12, Luke, the gospel writer, tells us, the Passover having concluded, Jesus lingered in Jerusalem. Yes, Twelve-year-olds today are beginning to exercise, are beginning to push the boundaries of independence from mom and dad. Were twelve-year-olds the same then as now? Was it normal for Jesus to not wonder why his mom and dad, Mary and Joseph, had not sought him out, checked on him all day long? Where did Jesus sleep that first night that he was alone in Jerusalem? The second night. Did not Jesus think it rather strange that Aunt Rachel and Uncle Nathan, I'm just making those names up, had not found him, instructing him, Jesus, we're leaving. Everybody is heading out to return to Nazareth. In fact, your mom and dad left yesterday. Come on, let's go. But no. Jesus in Hollywood terms, is left behind. And he is home alone in Jerusalem. Jesus as a boy had learned about Passover before his first pilgrimage to Jerusalem. He had been told the story of his ancestors' slavery in Egypt. It had been described to him the instruction to the Hebrew families, and really to all families as well, Egyptian included, who had seen the awesome demonstration after demonstration of the power of the plagues upon the land, neutralizing and humiliating the defiance of Pharaoh. Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know Yahweh, nor will I let Israel go. Jesus had been told about the taking of a lamb, slaying it, taking its blood, 
and painting it on the door frame. And that all who would get inside under the blood would be safe. They would be delivered. They would be granted freedom as the angel of death would pass over that residence. The families who were under the blood. Jesus had heard all about it as a boy at home in Nazareth. Did Jesus also hear about the unusual happenings with his birth? Did he hear that he was a miracle child? That an angel had announced his coming into the world to his mother before it happened? Did he hear that an angel had visited his father, Joseph, instructing him what to name him? Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Did he hear of the prophecy of the elderly Simon at the time of his dedication in the temple that this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed? Did Jesus hear about this as a three-year-old, as a five-year-old, and then again as a ten-year-old in the version for a ten-year-old? Are you willing to bet seven shekels that he did hear about it? And now Jesus in Jerusalem for Passover witnesses all that he has been told day by day at the temple. He is impressed with the significance of the services. Every act seems to be connected to him. Thoughts, promptings stir within him, silent and absorbed. He seems to be studying out a great issue, the mystery of his mission, like the rising of the sun at dawn, is beginning to come into his understanding and comprehension. Jesus is absorbed. For three days he is in the temple, alone, without family, sitting in the midst of teachers, both listening to them and asking questions And all who hear him are astonished at his understanding and answers. And when Mary and Joseph finally locate him with anxiety and a slight tone of irritation, ask, Son, why have you done this to us? Why do you seek me? Jesus responds. Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Engaged in my father's interests? You told me about the angelic visits and the messages you received at my birth. Do you not know? Did Jesus start thinking about the joy that was set before him at the age of 12? Or was he thinking about suffering and agony? Given his pre-existence as creator, as one who had handcrafted Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in the image of the divine, and rightly understanding the pre-human Jesus as the one who pronounced all creation as good, 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 very good, it is reasonably credible to conclude that Jesus experienced joy, even great joy, during his public ministry as he brought healing and restoration to those whom sin had degraded. He experienced joy When four friends were relentless, they would not give up, even dismantling the roof of someone else's residence so that they could get their friend in front of Jesus for healing, a healing that they thought would only bring renewed physical function to useless legs. Oh, but they got way, way more than they anticipated. 
Yes, the legs became strong. And the heart was unburdened, unshackled. Son, your sins are forgiven you. Rise, get up, and walk. Did Jesus get joy in that? I think he did. Jesus got joy when in the midst of a people-crowded street, something unexpectedly seemed to be sucked out of him. Vitality, energy, from the inside out, like some preset arrangement, desperate need infused with faith, connected with the divine touch point. Now, if the apostle would write some decades into the future that without faith it is impossible to please God, then this touch, this touch point was highly pleasing. The touch that spontaneously drew divine energy out of Jesus when he said, oh daughter, your faith has made you well. Go and be healed of your affliction. If sinners were drawn to be in the presence of Jesus, for he earned that title, according to Matthew 11, that he was a friend of sinners... And if mothers were drawn to Jesus, that he might bless their children, then there was something that was innately attractive about the persona of Jesus. And joy is just one of those elements of his persona. That inner calm of, I know who I am, I am comfortable in my own skin. Joy was innate to Jesus when he walked into the arena of public ministry, when around Jesus people sensed, he has what I want. There's something in it. There's something I cannot quite define, yet I can feel it when I'm in his presence. And what he has, I want. Surveying Jesus, one has observed that in every human being, he discerned infinite possibilities. He saw men as they might be, transfigured by his grace. Looking upon them with hope, he inspired hope. Looking upon them with confidence, he inspired trust. Revealing in himself man's true ideal, he awakened for its attainment both desire and faith. In his presence, souls despised and fallen realized that they were still men and they longed to prove themselves worthy of his regard. Yes, there were days, there were experiences, there were conversations, there were healings, there were responses that were anticipated in joy and lived in joy and resulted in joy. But always present, always conscious, always subconscious, always anticipated with the lingering clouds on the periphery and sometimes directly overhead of sorrow and suffering. Isaiah prophetically described it. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was oppressed and afflicted. He was despised and rejected. John, the gospel writer, looks back on Jesus' life, echoing what Isaiah had foretold. He came unto his own, but his own received him not. 
And in the days of ministry, punctuated with joy, was the ever-present reality of what Jesus had begun to comprehend when he was a 12-year-old in the temple at Passover. The lamb on the altar providing deliverance. How many Passovers did Jesus attend after the age of 12? Likely, all of them. How much more deeply did this significance of Passover internalize within him with each successive Passover that he attended? If Jesus proclaimed at the beginning of his public ministry, the time is fulfilled, if he understood Daniel's prophecy of the Messiah Prince to come, then he knew precisely what was before him. For Daniel had stated in his ninth chapter that that Messiah would be cut off. And he knew precisely what would occur. Three times in Jesus' ministry, as recorded by John, Jesus states, my hour is not yet come. My hour is not yet come. My hour is not yet come. Now, it is not yet. But not yet means it's coming. It's not today. It's not this week. But it is coming. And three times in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus reminds the twelve, we are going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes. And they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him. And the third day he will rise again. Not yet. Not yet, not yet, but it's coming. And then the day after his celebrated entry into Jerusalem, just prior to Passover, Jesus states publicly in the temple, the hour has come, John 12, that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Now my soul is troubled, Jesus continues. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose. I came to this hour. Do you see it? Do you sense it? Do you feel it? This paradoxical combination of suffering and joy. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. This is an echo of something else Jesus had said earlier. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever desires to lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, will save it. Is the same true with suffering and joy? <clears throat> A paradoxical experience. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame? Endured the cross in our contemporary time, we do not subject animals 
lawfully to the horror and the torture that the cross inflicted in the Roman era. And before Jesus even got to the cross, he had already been humiliated and inhumanely abused, physically depleting his capacity to survive. What he had foretold became reality. Condemnation, mocking, spat upon. I know that's inappropriate, but that's just fractional compared to what Jesus actually experienced. Beating, flogging, two times, the physical abuse so great, taking its toll so intensely that he literally did not have the physical strength to shoulder the cross to the location of the final execution, Golgotha, the skull. And what is amazing, astonishing, is that Jesus freely chose and subjected himself to all of this. He freely chose it. The Sanhedrin may have thought that they were now in control of this pain in the neck, irritant, no-name, self-styled, blue-collar rabbi who challenged their power structure. But the Sanhedrin were not in control. Jesus had already stated before this Passover week, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down. And I have power to take it again. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when a multitude assigned by the chief priest came with swords and clubs to arrest Jesus, Peter whips out his little pocket sword to defend, and Jesus tells him, put away the sword. What is happening is to fulfill what has been foretold. If I choose to, I can now pray to my Father, and He will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels. And in the Roman era, historians tell us that a legion could range between 3,000 and 7,000 soldiers. So let's just go on the low end. If I choose to, Jesus claims, I can pray right now, and in this moment, at least 36,000 angels will immediately descend and deliver me. This mob, the Sanhedrin, they're not in charge. Caiaphas, not in charge. Caiaphas rails, do you answer nothing? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus keeps silent, and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Okay, Jesus is not going to deny his identity. It is as you say. Nevertheless, Caiaphas... I say to you, hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest, the Bible tells us, tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look now, you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? And they answer, he is deserving of death. Oh, it appears to Caiaphas and to the council that at that moment they are in charge. But ultimately, no. Jesus had already gone on public record. No one takes my life from me. 
I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down. And I have the power to take it again. Pilate is not in charge. Pilate, irritated with Jesus, searching for some way to resolve this dilemma that he's been put in, says, are you not speaking to me, Jesus? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? <laughs> Jesus replies, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Pilate is not in charge. Jesus is in charge. We cannot begin to grasp the internal, I could, but I can't. That Jesus was constantly battling during his humiliation and suffering. Oh, Lucifer knew the exact button. He knew the exact trigger to pull with Jesus. While on the cross, the taunts were shouted out. Those who passed by, blaspheming him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroyed the temple and will build it again in three days, save yourself if you are the Son of God. Come down from the cross. And likewise, the chief priest, also mocking, said, He saved others, but he can't save himself now. Ha, 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 ha. If he is the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Jesus had to absorb and process that second by second, minute by minute. I could, but I can't. What then is the joy that empowered Jesus to endure through it all. What is the joy that kept him pinned on the cross? Consider. Consider what Jesus said and what he taught just before the cross about the future, the other side, post cross. Consider what Jesus said and taught personally and then universally. Personally. Just hours before his betrayal, when his hour would commence in all of its intensity, Jesus said to his disciples, this is John 15, These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. What are these things? Check them out in John 14, John 15, John 16, John 17 to get the full picture. But here are a few examples of these things, innate with joy, the joy of Jesus. These are statements from Jesus. As the Father has loved me, I love you. Abide, dwell, remain in my love. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come, and we will make our home with him. Greater has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. You, you are my friends. If you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. 
but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. And then in his prayer, John 17, we hear Jesus pour out the desire of his heart. Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. When Jesus was being flogged, beaten, did these words that he had just spoken hours before come back to him? If, oh, if I don't endure this, if I don't follow through what I promised to my friends will not come true. Mary had anointed Jesus with fragrant oil. Jesus stated, future, that wherever this gospel is preached in all the world, what she has done for me will be told as a memorial for her. Could Jesus... Could he smell the lingering fragrance of that oil as he was hanging on the cross? Was he thinking, if I bail now, if I call out now, Father, I've had enough. I can't take this anymore. Rescue me. Deliver me. This is futile. No one gets it. If I push the eject button now, Mary will not get her recognition of me. Jesus himself had predicted and prophesied, I, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself so that where I am, you may be also. This is just a fraction of the personal element of joy that Jesus experienced on the cross. Huh? Consider the universal. In that same week, immediately leading up to the suffering and the cross, Jesus had prophesied, the Son of Man will come on clouds, the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send his angels with the sound of a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heaven to the other. Did Jesus think to himself while on the cross, I will get to welcome those who have faithfully followed me. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Do I really want to forfeit that? Consider the universal. With my suffering, my sacrifice, the liar, the murderer, the devil is fully exposed. And in his exposure, the devil is defeated. The universe will see through my death that the power of death, that is of the devil, is destroyed. The universe will see that I am just and true and the ways of my Father and me. The government of heaven will stand justified. Satan's charges are refuted and his character is unveiled. Rebellion will never rise again. The universe will see that from this skull hill, the law of self-renouncing love is the law of life for heaven and earth. If I give up now, if I give in now, that won't happen for the joy that was set before him. Suffering is now, but glory, joy is certain to come. In obedience to his death, even the death on the cross, 
I will be highly exalted. I will be given the name that is above every name. If I hang on while hanging from this cross, I will behold a great multitude which no man can number of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. I will hear the worship of the universe, blessing and glory and honor and wisdom and thanksgiving and power and might be to our God forever and ever. I will see those who have come out of their own great tribulation, having washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. I will see them before the throne in heaven. There will be no more need for miraculous healings and miraculous provisions, for they will neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. I will be in the midst of them. I will be their shepherd. All tears will have been wiped away. There will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There will be no more pain. The former things have all passed away. The dwelling, the abiding of God and his people that he created in his image. They are now together. They are redeemed and they are one forever. For this joy, this joy, Jesus thanks to himself, I can endure the cross despising its shame. And thus Jesus became the author of eternal salvation, Hebrews 5, through this prayers and the vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. But ultimately said, no. Because where I am, I want them to be also, to see my glory, to experience with us, Father, what we experience. On the cross, Jesus said that in faith. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. That's Jesus. Sealed with his final words, it is finished. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. That's his story. That's his offering, his indescribable, priceless gift to us. The paradoxical combination of suffering and joy. Do you see it? Do you sense it? Do you feel it? Linger. At the cross with the Roman centurion, humbled, amazed, overwhelmed, confessed, truly, this man was the Son of God.